been a while, hasn't it, since I've been up here? Hi. Are you all ready for fall break? I know several of you have it coming up, don't you? Hey, so it's not my story to share, but you know this Sunday there are about 11 people in one service getting baptized. Yeah. So many of them are your peers or your peers or your small group leaders' kids. So I want to encourage you, if you're available, to make sure you support all of those that are getting baptized this Sunday at 11 or 9.45, okay? So we're going to talk about regret tonight. How many of you have regrets? Right? And I mean regrets, not regrets, okay? For that famous... uh, tattoo commercial, right? Do you, you sure you don't have any regrets? None? One certain letter? Some of you know what I'm talking about. So I have a regret, all right? So growing up, uh, my dad was really passionate about greyhounds. Any of you have a greyhound in here? Okay. So there's these dogs that used to race, and my dad felt really compassionate because of what they did after they were done racing. So his passion became uh, this idea of we're going to adopt these dogs out to families that want these dogs. So we started, (laughs) yes, I do mean we, because I was involved in this. And so we started adopting them out, and families started coming over. So we adopted our first one for us, and it was great. And so we ended up with seven in the house. Yeah. Yeah. It's too many. This is, some of this is why I loathe animals, okay? So what happened is my dad decided that we are going to start adopting these dogs out. And so to do that, he's going to take, we would take runs uh, to, to go up to these racetracks, take the dogs that were done racing, and bring them home. So most of the time, we had 20 dogs in our barn with air conditioning, plus the seven in the house. Here's why I struggle with it. My dad loved these dogs, but my dad traveled Monday through Thursday. Guess whose passion it became? Yeah, it became my passion. So, and these dogs lived in their crates. And so you, you think, well, seven in the house is a lot, but re- ultimately the dogs laid down about 22 hours a day. They really did. So they, they lived in their crates. But, so, but these dogs had to be let out to eat, let out to run around the pasture, and then back into their crates. And so, and obviously, 20 dogs create 20 piles of poop. Guess who had to mow the grass? There is nothing worse than mowing the grass and just poof. Right? It just stinks so much worse. So there's some pickup that has to be done, right? So I made the mistake once of uh, telling my uh, stepmom that I hate these dogs. That was not good. It was not good. I had a lot of regrets, things that I said. Um, This was one of my more weakest moments. And so guess what happened? When dad decided to travel, instead of my stepmom helping me, since she knew I hated them, guess who got to take care of them all the time? Me. I had to let them out. I had to help feed them. And then our entire life revolved around these stupid animals, all right? Oh, let's go to dinner. Oh, we got to be home, make sure we're home to let the dogs out. Well, let's go to Six Flags. I I really didn't like Six Flags because it made me nauseous. But, oh, we got to be home to let the dogs out. Like, our life revolved around these dogs. So I regret saying that. So now in my family, I have this notorious idea that anytime we go home to visit, I don't like any of my dad's animals around me. Like, none of them. I don't want any of them near me. Okay? Um, Which there is some truth to that. Okay? I don't. I have this space, and this is animal-free. Right? So... This is funny. My dad literally comes up to the steps, and he will say, it's time for bed. Let's go to bed, my jungle creatures. And I kid you not, the dogs and the cats run up the steps to jump in bed with him. It is the creepiest thing ever. It, it, I'll record it this Christmas for you. 
all right? It is disgusting, all right? Deb, Deb is over here, and she's, like, laughing because she knows it's true. This is what he does. They just flock upstairs, and they lay in bed with him. It's gross. How big is that bed? What? It's a king size. I mean, he's got, he had three cats and four dogs at one point, and so it's, it's, it's weird. You know, I'll just say this because growing up, we had to sit on the couch. Sit. There was no laying. Couches were not made for laying. They're made for sitting. But when we got married and moved out and we came home for Christmas, and like, man, this couch stinks like cat pee. <laughs> he thinks it's the funniest thing ever. We can't lay on the couch, but the cat peeing on the couch is funny, right? So we pick on him for that. So here's the deal. Have you ever said something you regret? Like, that, that seems like really nominal, and it, and it really is for the most part. But there are some things that you, maybe you have said that you really regret. Maybe it's to a teacher. Maybe it's to a brother or sister. Maybe it's to your parents. Maybe it's to a friend. Or maybe it is something you've done or something you've thought about that you can't shake, that it's just in your head. Tonight, that's what I want to talk about. How do you shake this idea of regret? Whatever it is, because a lot of times the regret will stick with you. Your, our goal is a follower of Jesus, and, and what we're going to celebrate on Wednesday is this, or Sunday is this idea of baptism. It's this idea of, man, the old is gone. We're a new person in Christ, and he is in the process of restoring you, and he's in the process of restoring me. So how do we get rid of these regrets? All right, so if you've got your Bibles, we're going to be in Isaiah 58. That's the chapter we're going to be in. So I need to give you some background first. Because the verse that we're going to read, you're going to, you're going to hear it, and you're going to be like, what in the world does that have to do with regrets? So here's what it says in verse uh, 59, verses 8 and 9. Isaiah 58, 8 and 9. This is what it says. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you, and the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Like, what in the world does that have to do with regrets? Well, here's the background that helps you know why this particular verse is written. So at this time, we know that the 12 tri- the Israel, the people were divided up into 12 tribes. They just didn't like what was going on. You know, this is why we have First Baptist Church, Second Baptist Church, and Second Coming, and Third Coming, and First Coming, and we have all these different names, right? Because someone didn't agree with something, and so they left. Well, what happens is these people didn't agree with others, so the tribes split. Ten went with one, and two go with this other one, Okay? And so what happened is this group, this groups of two, were held captive by the Babylonians. Who else is associated with the Babylonians? Any names come to mind? Daniel, yeah. All right, so, he's being, so they're being held captive. And they've been held captive for a long time. They basically have been kicked out of their country. All right? For some of you, you know, you may have been kicked out of a movie theater or kicked out of, you know, when your parents are doing something, they don't want you to know, like for your birthday or something, they don't want you to know it, so they kick you out. And like, you want to be in that room. Most of the time, you have no desire to be in that room, but because you've been kicked out, you want to be in that room, just because they don't want you there. Well, what's happened is they've been kicked out, and they've been out for a long time. They're just, they're just out, all right? And so Isaiah is written to Israel, And the reason why this passage is so important is because at this point, they're starting to head back to their land. They're allowed to go back to their land. And what's going on here is they have, are paying for their sins. There's some consequences to the things they've done. And they're reaping those consequences right now. And they're finally allowed to go back in. Like, I'm not saying that their sin made them. I'm just simply saying there's consequences to the sins they made, and there's some things they're having to deal with. And so they're going back to their land. 
That's what this particular passage is all about. And so they're talking about doing these things, and they're talking about fasting, and they do it for the wrong reason. And God's calling them on it. He's saying, hey, you're doing this idea of fasting because you want it done. Not because you want to hear from me, but because you want to draw attention to yourself. Okay, so in that verse, it says this. Then shall your light break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up speedily. Your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. So here's what happens. When they're walking back into this land, they have this regret. And what they're seeing is the temples destroyed. Families have been divided. The land has been destroyed because of war. And their families are driven apart because some may have gone here. Their friends went there from different tribes. They're just split. And they're having this regret. They're seeing everything that's happened to the land. And they're probably feeling a little down. Let me relate it to you. If you've done something that you regret, when you confront that person or you're around that person you did something with, you try to avoid that person. If you know that there's something that you've done wrong, you try to avoid that person at all costs. Or maybe that group of people, you know that there's something going on that you may think about that you've done something to hurt their feelings or maybe they've done something to hurt you, you try to stay as far away from them as you possibly can. Or maybe you try to find a different friend group. Well, think about all those feelings that are going on with these, the people that are walking back into their land. They're feeling all of those things, that regret of the things they've done and all of the stuff they're seeing. They're feeling that pressure. So here's what it said. They're coming back to their land. They have fasted. If you look in the first part in 58, it says they fasted and God hasn't answered. For maybe some of you, you've done something. God, if you just fix this, I'll do this. And that's exactly what they have said. And if you look at the first part of Isaiah 58, it says, Cry aloud, do not hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Declare to the great people their transgressions, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet you seek me daily and delight to know my ways as if they were a nation that did righteousness. See, he's saying that you're doing all of these things, but you're doing it for the wrong reasons. You're doing it because you want people to see how spiritual you are. And for us, sometimes we do that very thing. We ask forgiveness or we say we're sorry and we really don't mean it. We just know it's the thing to do because we want to fix it, but we really don't meet it in our hearts. God's saying that's it's not the way to deal with it, that you've got to, you got to mean it. You've got to move past it, okay? And so it comes to this verse, this last part it, in verse 9 or 8. It says, your righteousness, righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. What does that mean? In military terms, correct me if I'm wrong, but your rear is, I've got your six, right? So what God is saying, that he is our rear guard. He has our back. He knows our best intentions. He has our rear guard. And so for some of us, when we are walking through life and we have all of these regrets, and we're saying things or doing things that other people aren't approving of or that we know don't go along with God's word, we're afraid. Because every time you do something, you're worried someone's going to come back to get you. What God is saying is, I've got your rear. I've got your rear guard. I will protect you. But you can't keep looking behind you thinking about the past. And that's what the Israelites here, as they're coming back to the land, they're thinking about their past. That's their regret. Their regret is, I've done this, I've done this, I've done this. God is saying, you you need to move forward. I get that you regret some things, but you've got to move forward. 
God has your rear guard. He's got your back. It doesn't mean that you can go out and do whatever you want to do, and God's just going to be like, well, I'll fix it. God is not a fixer, right? But he's saying, I- I've got your back. You have to trust me, right? I love scaring people. It's one of my favorite things to do, all right? I love scaring people. When Shane was little, I loved to scare him. It was so good. Um, I think I've told you this story before, but when Deb was pregnant, uh, I think she was like eight months pregnant. I hid behind a door. Uh, she thought I was gone. And so she went out to the pool area and uh, came back in and thought I went out for a run or something. I got her so good. We're lucky Shane was not born right there. But it's just fun. Well, when you scare someone, you have to hide. They, they, you can't, they can't know where you're at. When God's saying, hey, if I've got your back, there is nothing that can jump up and, and scare you because I, I got you. And if you're doing your part, God will do his part, and he's got you. All right? So here's the question. Sometimes the greatest enemy is yourself, that you have regrets that you have that you are dwelling on, and you've got to move past it. Maybe there's a sin in your life that you are hiding from everyone else. You're afraid that if someone else finds out what it is, it will ruin you. And your entire life revolves around hiding from that sin. Maybe it's a regret that you did something to a friend. Maybe it's a regret of an attitude that you have towards someone or something. And God's saying, hey, you've got regrets, but you've got to go forward. But for you to go forward, you've got to fix it. You've got to make it right. See, God's allowing them to go back into this land. He's allowing them to do it. So he's allowing them to move forward, and they're continuing looking back, thinking, oh, this is what i got to do. So tonight, your groups, my challenge for you is to talk about those regrets and how do you get past those regrets and how do you keep from having regrets. Because most of the time, our regrets are bad decisions we've made And how do we protect ourselves from making those decisions? All right? Let me pray. Father, we thank you for the time that we're able to gather together and look at your word. Father, I pray for the regrets that are in this room. We all have them. Father, I I pray that we are not defined by our regrets. You don't see us as our regrets, but you see us as children of God. And Father, I pray that you'd help us to move forward in confidence because of who you are, not because of who we are. Help us to get past those regrets and to deal with those regrets in a healthy way. We pray these things in your name. Amen. You guys are dismissed to your groups.